find that world that you want to exist in and immerse yourself in it. I say that the same musically. Immerse yourself in that sound, that vibe that you want to see reflected on yourself. You are now listening to the BV Mobile Apps Podcast. The show is designed to help you grow your mobile app audience and get advice from experts in your industry. Now, here's your host, Sean Garvey. On the telephone lines, I have a very gifted and talented artist that I've been waiting to interview during the course of the BB Mobile Apps podcast. As you all know, we play a lovely intro uh, into the show and an outro coming out of the podcast, courtesy of Jay Keys. And I had an opportunity to meet him a few years ago during a great production that we did behind the scenes. And uh, when I say this guy is talented, he is very talented. I had a chance to not only see his videos, but also listen to his music content as well. And I want to let you guys know that on today's podcast, because here at BB Mobile Apps Podcast, we always want to make aspiring artists and aspiring talent become successful in their brand to help them get to the next level. And today's theme is going to be all about developing music for theater and web series. And we have the right person on the telephone lines to talk about that. We have the one and only Jay Keys on the line. Hey, good day, Jay Keys. How's it going? Yo, yo, what's going on, Sean? How you feeling? Hey, I am feeling great now that you are here. And I am so glad that you are on the podcast with us to not only talk about your uh, background history in music, but to also give advice and tips on how aspiring artists and talent can develop music for theater and web series content. And we're going to talk a little bit about that in the second half of the podcast. I want to use the first half of the podcast to talk about all things considered J keys, because you do all of that. You uh, provide the music and the score for theater and you have your own web music series which is something that is definitely unheard of 10 15 20 years ago um but i i know you to be a detroit native i come across a lot of uh people from detroit with so much skills and so much talent coming out of that city when you think of detroit of course you can't help but to think of Slum Village to Big Sean to, of course, one of the greatest, Eminem. And being that you are an artist, your music, from what I read, is not considered to be all conscious, but not considered to be all straight from the hood. So let's talk about your unique sound. Uh, What is the sound like coming from an artist like Jay Keys? Well, that's a great question. I mean, it's a combination of, uh, it's more like a gumbo of the things that you just described. You know, I'm influenced obviously by all those artists, but also by artists of other genres. Um, growing up, like Detroit had, um, is, is well known for its Motown sound and a deep, rich legacy of soul. So, just as much as I was influenced by the hip hop uh, of my day, I've been equally influenced by the soul of, of, of that. And so soul seeps into all of my music. It's one of the things that runs consistent um, from the time I started up until now. Um, I keep the soul, I keep soul as the, as the center of it. And so, um, you know, people, you know, there are categories that we, in, in music, we're in, in life, we're, we're, I find that we're obsessed with comparisons. And so it's natural when you meet someone, the first question they want to know is, who do you sound like? And, you know, the, the short answer for me is I, I'm a product of everything I've ever heard. Uh, and the music that I hear on the radio, even though my music may differ from that, or the subject matter in certain records may di- differ from that, it's actually... Um, just as influential as the the artists that people would put me in the same boat as because um, when I hear certain things, I'm a guy who always likes to do what's not being done. And so um, when I feel that there is a lack of balance, 
I'm inspired. I'm inspired to write from the, from the perspective of somebody trying to even out the balance. So if all the records are about partying, you know, I do a song like my song "Guilty," which is produced by the Cultural Bastards. I put that out a couple years ago, um, and that's before you know the the, the nation erupted into um, the turmoil that it's in now. Um, my song "Guilty," I, I put that out because I was inspired by Trayvon Martin and 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 some of the early um you know casualties that we've seen lately and so now that we're like full on uprising status i'm actually finding that i'm not as inspired to do what i was doing before i'm i'm kind of you know that that wave of music has hit us i'm actually finding myself more inspired to do what's not being done and so i guess that's the short version i, I i'm the great balancer if you will and i speak for the everyday working person a lot of your influences come from the voices of outcasts and common and even Nas and Tupac, which I consider as storytellers, uh, as well as poets. And when people hear your music and hear the substance and the topics and the subjects, you even do a little bit of battling uh, in your content. And what I mean battling, like you, you also give out battle rap vibes to any mm -hmm. artist that wants it you have what you just said a gumbo is a combination of this is a combination of that and with the audience that you have uh that come to your concerts that come to your shows that you know come to you to see the great j keys what is the end game for those that come to you and want to hear you perform what do you want people to get out of what you are conveying to the masses and to the audiences absolutely i well first and foremost if you come to a j key show um we're gonna have a good time it's gonna be a party you're gonna get you're gonna get uh you know to me like i said i i'm a big fan of balance so i try to take you on a give you the full range of emotions i'm going to have upbeat records that are going to keep you moving i'm going to have records that make you think i'm going to perform records that um you know may draw upon sadness may draw upon joy um i, I try to make every performance a well-rounded show um i rock a lot of times with my band um we love to do um you know you know i i, I one thing as a hip-hop fan i should say I, I hate going to shows and somebody just stands there on stage and does the records exactly as you know them, you know, exactly as you're used to hearing them. So when you come to my show, um, you know, you might, you, you, you hear my band rock, you're gonna hear like a different, um, you're gonna hear some different instrumentation. You're gonna, I might play it a little faster. Uh, it's gonna have pauses, breaks, moments for you to come in and participate and be part of the show. Um, that that's 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 the type of performance I like. So the end game when you come to my show, I, I want you to leave with the memory. You know, life. I always say life is nothing more than a collection of memories. So, uh, you know, know that when you come see me perform, we've been well rehearsed. We've thought about everything we want to do, and we're trying to make memories. From my understanding, you lived in different parts of the world like you you're native of detroit born and raised but you lived in two different coasts which is the east coast and the west coast you lived in new york and you currently live in la which music scene do you prefer do you prefer the east coast or do you prefer the west coast so you trying to get me in trouble sean there's a there's a famous biggie line he says i live out there so don't go there no but uh in all seriousness you know new york um is really where i cut my artistic chops and i can speak to that scene um my time out there it was you know new york is heavily um about the craft um when you go to uh open mic spots you go to um underground venues um, any type of showcase even um, New York is really big on on craft and they listen they lean in they listen to your words um, there are a lot of artists in New York so you know they don't hesitate to let you know if, if you're not as good as their friend or their cousin 
Um, so I appreciated that. New York City helped me really hone my craft and sharpen my skills and focus in and be to be the best um, artist I can be. But when I came to L.A., it was it was definitely a culture shock. Um, one thing I can say about L.A., the scene here, um, it's more about the presentation. And those two may seem like the antithesis of each other. When I first got here, it was off-putting. You know, I did my very first show um, in L.A., and one of the critiques I got, everybody loved the show. People were rocking. People were with me. They were performing. You know, they were, they were singing along. They got up and started dancing. And it, it almost felt like one of my shows in New York, right? So then somebody comes up to me afterwards. You know, maybe the next day, I think I talked to him. And he's like, yo, Keys, man, I appreciate your show, man. It was dope. Everything. I have nothing bad to say about it. But he was like, yo, man, you know, one thing I have is what did you have on? You know, you, you could have wore that on a regular day. And I scratched my head because never, ever in New York City had I, you know, got that critique and, and thought to myself about, you know, I'm, a, I'm an MC, I'm a rapper. I had on a black T-shirt and some jeans, which seemed pretty standard. But, you know, I it, it, it was telling to me that, like, presentation is a thing out here. And so um, image, uh, people are more image conscious out here. So I say all that to say L.A. helped me to think more um, about the, the visual side and the visual presentation of it. And it's actually where I have delved deeper into my visuals um, living out here. So I, I love them both, you know, yeah, I, I, but if I have to choose just in terms of the music and the craft, um, you know, New York City is where you go to sharpen your sword and L.A. is where you go to get paid for it. So. That's a very great perspective. Uh, looking at it, uh, I, I I think that there shouldn't be no type of favoritism between the two because you mm -hmm. can benefit from both coasts. You can benefit from New York and L.A. I always look at New York as the sound, mm -hmm. uh, the, the beat of the city, uh, you know, and I look at L.A. as that scene, as the more of the visual uh, mm -hmm. more of expanding your reach outside of the East Coast to reach out to a different type of demographic. Uh, mm -hmm. So you can benefit from the two, which I absolutely agree. And uh, it has benefited you very well into the artist that you are today. Want to transition into talking about developing music for theater and web series content your background you're a man of many things we talked about it a little bit off the podcast and uh so with theater you you've done amazing work for theater behind the scenes as far as developing scores for uh theater I care to tell our listeners uh some of the projects you have been involved in for theater yeah, um, absolutely. I actually, um, just right now at this very moment, um, I, d I did the score for, um, and this is like since COVID hit, I did the score for a piece called Giselle the Gazelle. It's on playingonair.org, um, as well as um, a piece up and coming uh, for, this, for the same people, Playing On Air. Uh, it's coming up, it's called Third Grade. And that is about, um, that's basically, it's like they, they've done, essentially since there are no live performances, what they're doing is moving to an audio format. Um, so same type of thing you would do at a live production, but uh, I, I just scored, um, they, they bring the actors in, do everything socially distant, put people in rooms, they have them record. And I did the music for those two pieces, as well as the um, off-Broadway, OB-winning piece, Skeleton Crew, um that was directed by Ruben Santiago Hudson. He uh reached out to me um to score that piece. Uh my wife actually wrote that one and um you know it had a that particular piece um takes place in 2008 Detroit um around the you know the auto industry collapse and the economic crisis of of 08 and so it had a really regionally specific sound and um, you know, he wanted to capture something, Ruben wanted to capture something really beautiful and industrial. 
along with urban and gritty and um, influences like the, like the people we talked about, Slum Village, Royce Five Nine, um, Dilla. So he wanted to capture that sound. So he brought me in to do that. And that was um, probably like my breakout piece. That's awesome. That's awesome. And it is something to add to your repertoire. Absolutely. Of all the other great works that you have done in your career. Now, someone's listening to you and they want to break out as a person to do scores, whether it's for theater or whether it's for film or even do uh song jingles music jingles for commercials or even do a score for a tv series uh and and we're going to talk about some of the other aspirations that you want to get into a little bit later in the podcast as well uh but to focus on theater for a moment like i said someone is listening and they want to get their foot in the door what is the early process of one getting their foot in the door to start developing a score for a theatrical project. Let, let's talk about the genesis or the beginning stages of doing that. Okay, well, I'll give it to you on two tiers. Uh, one, I always say everything you do in life is an audition. So to begin with, I say that everyone should start by honing their craft and unapologetically doing what they do um, in terms of music, get get the best you can possibly get um, with the resources you have, uh, collaborate with people around you, um, get your sound. Um, but in, in, in 2020 and 2021, it's ultra important that you first set yourself up to be able to do uh, what you love. And I say that from the standpoint of I went and invested in equipment and learned how to produce. I learned how to record myself. It all started by learning how to record myself and learning how to uh, basically be a one-stop shop um, because at the end of the day, um, your brand is going to speak loudest. And, and, and so number one thing is to get good at what you do, um, get confident at what you do. Um, don't be scared to, to tear it down, rebuild it. And then the other thing is participate in the in the culture of where you want to work. If you want to score music for theater, start attending shows, get to know actors, get to know playwrights, get to know directors um, in that world. Um, because just like everything, it's a relationship uh, building process. And the same applies for um, web, film, and TV. Um, the beautiful thing is that you know, there's a lot of intersectionality in these worlds. So by meeting actors um, in one medium or meeting directors in one medium or meeting, um, you know, producers, et cetera, in, in one medium, there's a lot of people doing multiple things that, you know, may also work in film or may also work on web series. And so I, I would say getting your relationships on and just supporting people at times when uh, supporting people at times when you have nothing to gain, you know, it's not always transactional. I, w I wouldn't approach it like, um, I show up to this event. I meet this person. I now feel like I deserve something from this person. No, just come be a participant in the world, um, in, in the environment and the culture of, of the world you want to work in. That's, that's always step one. And quite honestly, from there is just consistency. The more people see you, the more you'll start getting calls out of the blue and, and let, let it let what you do be known. And that's exactly how it's worked for me. Let's talk about equipment for a moment in order to get something done and to bring it to life. What are the right type of or what is the right type of equipment that one must have in order to start the creative process of developing a score? I mean, of course, there's uh pro tools there's logic uh there's audio mixers but what else should a person have in his or her own studio to create that potential award-winning score for theater or other projects mm -hmm. well I, I say this you don't have to have the best of everything you just need a, a little bit of a range. I could tell you I have a couple of keyboards. I have a preamp. 
I have a laptop and it all started from recording and I just kind of built my repertoire um, on the music side. I built my repertoire like that. Um, you know, I have different software that I, I've, I've used. You know, Logic is my weapon of choice. But believe it or not, I actually started out in GarageBand when I didn't have any money or any resources. GarageBand was the free program that, that comes on the Mac and I used that. So all of my early records are actually on GarageBand and I was you'd be amazed you'd be surprised if I played you some of the stuff that that I did in GarageBand you would be amazed but you know eventually I graduated to Logic um and I just I have you know crates of vinyl around me I have uh I've used also uh FL Studio um but then I also you know I I would say I also have musical instruments in here as well that I use. You know, there's, um, you know, there's no one set direction to it. But what I will say is um, something it took me years to um, really embrace. You know, growing up in the hip hop era, I was I always thought of a producer as someone who um, who sits behind digital equipment and, you know, creates these masterpiece sounds and the truth of the matter is you know a lot of the stuff i start with will be skeletons and so a producer doesn't necessarily have to do every single th every single uh thing on the on the musical project but you know when to bring in an expert you know i don't play saxophone i go and get uh a saxophone player for a part that i want and i coach him on what to do that's also another side of production that's kind of under, you know, under um, undervalued, I should say, or under celebrated, um, you know, the Quincy Jones era. You know, I don't know if Quincy played any instruments on on uh, Michael Jackson's album, but I, I wouldn't be surprised if he didn't play not one because, you know, the producer side of it is curating and making making the sound happen. Um, and so it's as much being able to hear what's right and what's not right. Um, so, um, aside from the technological side of it and playing instruments, all of that helps. I would say your ear is, is the like invisible instrument that nobody, um, that people don't mention a lot. So, um, having the right ear, listening to different genres of music, different formats, you know, some of your favorite records that you, um, as big as Kendrick Lamar is, you go through his records and all of his all of his hits his hit records are samples of songs that are not hip hop songs at all. You listen to them, and they're this random obscure record that has three thousand views on YouTube. So you know, being a producer is also about having the ear and being able to dig for the right sounds. Uh, for those who are just tuning in to the BV Mobile Apps podcast, we have music artist and a, a man of many hats on the line here we have jay keys and we're talking about developing music for theater and web series content uh, i want to piggyback on something important that you said as well a few minutes ago about a person that does scores for theater or for any type of visual content that they have to know the actors and the actresses and the cast and the crew of that particular project. And when you said that along with something else you said a few moments ago too about Quincy Jones, I think of the chemistry between Raphael Sadiq and Issa Rae. Uh, and I say that because Raphael Sadiq does the music production for Insecure. And, you know, even speaking of Issa Rae, the movie, the photograph in which I had a chance to see a few months ago, uh, the music was courtesy by Robert Glasper. Uh, and I could just imagine the chemistry that they had uh, on and off set to really match the music to the film. Or if you want to take it way back, I think of the chemistry between the dearly departed and iconic Prince and his relationship with acclaimed award winning filmmaker Spike Lee when they worked together for the score behind Girl 6 back in the 90s. Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. And I want you to go ahead and tell the listeners, because you've been doing this for a minute, the importance of having that relationship and having that great chemistry between you as an artist slash producer 
and the director or the executive producer or the person who is doing the project. Talk to us about the the chemistry and why that is so important to have in this business to make it. Absolutely. So, you know, and, and I like in this, um, it's just like any job, you know, Sean, like you, you, you want to get along with your coworkers. You want to work with people that have similar visions or people that support your vision or can help build and be part of a team. So, you know, it is invaluable to have um, a good relationship with, you know, a director or the people involved with the project um, just from, you know, both personally and in, in creatively um, music um, for stage music, for TV music, for film is like the, um, the extra character, you know, you'll watch something and be moved to an emotion and not realize why you're moved, you know, um, whether it's a, a romantic uh, moment or whether it's a, a sad moment, um, try watching that movie on mute or with no music. Um, the emotion that the, the music is almost like um, it's almost like the extra character, you know, the extra invisible character that adds depth and layers to to what you're watching. And so to be in sync with um, to be in sync with your director um, is to help tell the story, um, the emotional story of the film or, or whatever project, whether the, the play, the, the film or the um, the TV show. And so a uh, great example when I, was when I worked with um, Ruben Santiago Hudson on Skeleton Crew. Um, it takes place in an auto factory. And so we took and made these um, industrial sounds. Um, we took and made them hip hop. And you, you literally have the sound of gauges and steam and, um, and, 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 you know, pipes and brass fittings that are actually syncopated and hitting on beat as if they were a hip hop beat and they were a hip hop beat. And so, um, that was a brilliant vision that, you know, we collaborated on, you know, and so it all comes from, you know, just being an open collaborator, you know, I think when people can check their egos at the door and do what's best for the art, um, that's when, you know, beautiful work gets done. I want to talk about web content now. Uh, we talked about theater. Web content is a different beast compared to theater. Does it take a lot to do scoring and or music production for web content? content versus theater um no yes and no it's it's the same muscle you know from the music side i, I would say no it's the same muscle um theater is a little bit different in that you build it um to happen over and over um night after night so there are things you have to take into account programming something live um versus when you do it for you know film in, in web series even you're you know nine out of ten dealing with editing and dealing with post-production um which is a little more i mean you deal with that also in, in theater but um what you when you do it for film you're doing it once and it's going to live forever the way you put it out there whereas uh, you know on stage you can tweak things you can you know manipulate certain things for certain shows and certain audiences if you choose um but i would say in terms of um you know that's on the music side now if you produce your own content as well um from the visual standpoint meaning filming and filming doing editing as well just depends on how hands are you are if you're just if you're uh if you just strictly want to do music and hand it off to someone else then it's just you know it's a collaborative piece like we've been speaking about but for example with keys to the booth I'm I executive produced that um, vi from a visual standpoint and from the musical standpoint. So I'm I'm actually literally on the cutting board with the visuals, um, and I'm also on the cutting board with the with the music. And I, I crafted all the sounds. So you know that's a pretty in, in depth process. But you know I look at it as the um, you know it's kind of like the uh, 
the culmination of everything I ever learned. So from marketing, you know, when I first entered the music business, I actually worked in promotions, um, you know, at a record label. So it, it it's, you know, it's a, it's keys to the booth is the perfect marriage of everything I've ever done in my career from, you know, on the video side, the music side to even the marketing side, I come up with the branding and, um, you know, things like that. So it just depends on how hands are on you, you want to be, you know, something, sometimes you can hand things off and delegate, but I say more than anything in 2020, the key is to get all of your bases covered before you worry about doing everything, um, at Hollywood status or at, you know, major label status, you know, get cameras, get your, figure out how you're going to get your editing done, figure out how you're going to get your music created, cover all your bases, and then worry about getting the best camera or the best software or the best this. And quite honestly, all these camera phones shoot in 4k. So everyone, you know, if you're, if you're doing this on a budget or doing it yourself, um, it's really most important to learn lighting and, um, angles and things like that so it can you know a lot can be done with a little and i'm so glad you said that so like for example i'm working on a project but i realized that i only have myself and one other person on the project where we're doing it it seems like we're going to be ended up doing everything from Mm -hmm. the audio to the editing to the writing and stuff but i realized that you need a team, like you said. You need this person and that person to help execute the project. But mm-hmm. where do one go to build that team? Do you just put an ad on social media saying, hey, we're looking for uh, this type of talent to help execute the project? Or do you set up audition calls um, at limited places? And, and the reason why I say limited places is because of COVID-19. Right. But, right. but, but, but how can you put together a team to help execute the project absolutely so (laughs) i'm going to tell you the real honest to goodness truth and i'm not even going to sugarcoat it that's always going to be an ongoing process over the years i've worked with so many people um that have been focused people that have been unfocused people that show up to things late people that say they're coming and they don't come so you almost you have to have backup plan. And that's kind of how I got to be a guy that wears many hats, um, because I knew that if, the, you know, if nothing else, I could count on myself, you know, to to get it done. And so, yeah, to answer your question, the short version is it's an ongoing process and you got to have a Rolodex of at least four people to do. You know, if you need an editor, have a have a Rolodex of four people, because the one you may want may be busy, he may be on vacation, she may be. Uh, doing anything she may be on another project you know so I I think it's imperative for um, independent artists in particular to have a Rolodex of people and yeah some of it's going to be um, the best way for me I find is uh, referrals I kind of reverse engineer I I look at you know I, I go and look at other people's work and go find out who did that and so I might go hey who who is the DP on this on this uh music video and then i go backwards figure out who that was track them down and see if we could work together and it's just like a repeat cycle and then as far as talent yeah there are talent websites that i've used you know um but i find that you know so i i use a combination because nothing is foolproof you know people sometimes people you know will be will flake on you whereas people that you don't know will be more dependable because you know, they don't want to get a bad reputation. So um, there's really no set thing. I kind of always do a combination of both. I'll, I'll go on the websites, um, put out an open call for people, and then I'll get some of those people. And then at the same time, I'll, I'll get referrals. Um, one thing that I, I that has been working really good for me, um, I have three new music videos coming out um, that are already done, shot and edited. And one of the things that worked really good, I have a lot of actor friends. And so I collaborated with some of them who wanted to flex a different muscle. They're used to being being the ones being directed on camera. And so this give them, you know, this gives them an opportunity to get on the other side and direct other people. So I found that that worked out really great because 
actors, no actors, and um, they were bringing, um, they were they were able to bring some great talented people to the um, to the process. I have a video coming out called "Very Important People." I worked with a, a dope actor named Kamal Bolden on that one, and he brought to the table some really amazing actors. One, um, a couple of which I knew and were my friends already. And then I also worked with um, Keisha Wade. Um, I'm sorry, Keisha May. I'm sorry. Uh, I worked with uh, Lakeisha May on um, my video, Medicine Man. She is also an actor who, um, you know, stepped out from behind the camera to direct. And I found that that process worked out really good. So I think, you know, finding people in and around the world that may want to flex another muscle um, also is great. Jay Keys on BV Mobile Apps podcast with the architect here, Sean Garvey. Uh, going back a little bit into the conversation about keys to the booth. Uh, you currently have a what is called a web music series online and you're displaying your talent on the mic. Uh, and it's very great cinematography as well from a visual standpoint. What inspired you to create keys to the booth? Well, to be honest, you know, I have been in quarantine um, you know, and as a, as an artist, you work your whole, you know, your whole drive is to create, you know, work that looks and feels and sounds, um, visually and sonically superb. You, we spend all this time trying to do things that are really polished. And as we were in quarantine and couldn't do anything, you know, it kind of brought me back to stripping things down to just the art. Like I started out as just an MC who wrote and, you know, with keys to the booth, I wanted to return to that in a time when, you know, a lot of people are in isolation and we're all in isolation and taking precautions. I wanted to give people art that they didn't have to wait for and didn't have to wait for it to be super polished. Um, Jazzy Jeff has this saying, um, this phrase, this slogan, called die empty and he talks about how basically in your lifetime you can never put out all the music that you create or all the art that you create or all the whatever you do and so your best bet is to just get out as much of it as possible and um let the world find it and so you know this year i lost my mother um unfortunately in may um to a battle with cancer and so that was the other driving force was like, you know, let me stop waiting for everything to be perfect and let it be organic and trust that, you know, the art will reach who it needs to reach at the time it needs to reach. And the beautiful thing is that we live in the Internet era where you may not discover J Keys today. You may not discover J Keys for three years from now, but we're leaving this digital footprint, this breadcrumb trail that you can pick up one day and, you know, discover this art. It's always new to somebody. So that's how Keys to the Booth was birthed. Even in the internet world that we're living in right now, obviously is not what is what was it like 20, 25 years ago. It's a different kind of era. So I can only imagine that you as a music artist, you had to somewhat adapt to the streaming world of music when it comes to putting yourself out there as an artist compared to CDs and vinyl and, and how much of you you had to put in to adapt to the new streaming way uh, to the new streaming world that we're in right now of music consumption uh, I had to adapt a lot um, to be honest Sean and, and, and one of the biggest ways is you know Content now, um, exactly the word content. Um, I don't even I don't even particularly love that word. Um, to me, it's art. But we look at art as content now to be consumed, and then you go on to the next thing. Once you've consumed it, you're done with it. Um, whereas, you know, in the days where you had, you know, a physical product, uh, a, 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 a record, vinyl, a cassette, a CD you know, you actually had a product and it lasted longer, you know, um, the, you know, the tangible product weeded out a lot of, um, half-hearted 
artist is what I'll say. You know, if you wanted to be a rapper in the days of CD, vinyl, and cassettes, you had to go to a studio, pay hourly. Um, they had to use DAT machines back then. Um, so you had to save your money or, or get somebody that you, it, it meant a lot to go record a song back in the day. So it attracted serious people. And just like DJing, you know, it took a lot to DJ back in the day because you had to have crates. You had to, you know, you had to have, uh, you know, a lot of DJs brought their own tables sometimes. Um, and so it attracted people that were very serious about it because the, you know, the barrier to entry was so high. Like, you know, you now it's a lot easier to do, which is, you know, beautiful because it, it opens it up to more people. But it also um, opens it up to more people in a way that you attract half hearted people um, that are not necessarily passionate about it. They may be passionate about fame and visibility, whereas, you know, someone that would save six thousand dollars working a part time job back in the day to record an album. That was someone you knew was passionate. So I think, one, you're competing against. Uh, a bunch of you're competing for time basically you're competing for people's attention and you're up against people who are half-hearted um, with it you know you could be you know today they may be recording songs tomorrow they may be doing you know I don't know some sort of reality show <laughs> um, but the goal isn't necessarily the art and so you're up against that and so one of the things I found in adapting is that I had to, I had to position myself to be, um, to be a well, if you speak, if you think. Um, and, and by that, I mean to be able to continuously put out stuff, you know, what if, you know, I, everything I approach, I think from the mind state of what if nobody helps me? What if nobody gives me a thing? What if nobody gives me a helping hand? Would I still be able to do it? And so, over the years and over time, that's what I've done. I've invested in equipment. I've done the, you know, the research. I've done online tutorials and taught myself how to do everything so that I don't have to, you know, if all else fails, I can bet on me or I can, you know, I know when, you know, or when I get overwhelmed, I bring in somebody to, to, to do this piece. Um, and it's made me a better artist. So I, I'd say to anybody that's passionate about art and music learn as much as you can about what you do learn as many different facets of the craft um don't just stop with the thing that you know gets you the most attention you know prince was a singer a famous singer but he also did a lot more prince could jump on and play all of his instruments you know he was very hands-on so i say in the streaming era um knowing that music is disposable position yourself to be able to last a long time, learn how to do things and, you know, find collaborators um, that can help you learn how to do things for the long haul. You know, you get $10,000, it might not be the best idea to, to blow it on one single. You know, maybe start thinking of how to expand your life and do it for a long time because in this day and age, people respect longevity more than anything. 20 plus years ago, you had a plethora of music videos that came out, uh, whether it was on MTV, BT, VH1. Um, and the accomplishment for those music videos being distributed was to give artists a bigger platform than just only using that one avenue which is radio uh industry makers and consumers lovers of the music they didn't want to just only hear their favorite artists on the radio but they also wanted to see the artists on tv fast forward to now uh it's all about web content and with your series keys to the booth what is and, and this is a two-part question by the way what are you hoping to accomplish with your web music series, Keys to the Booth? That's one question for you. And the second question is, is this the same model or formula you encourage 
aspiring talent to do as well now that we're in the internet age of all things considered web content that's a two-part question for you gotcha so um in terms of helping hoping to accomplish i don't want to look at keys to the booth as a transactional thing i'm actually just you know more than anything i want to give um, more than I want to receive from it. I want to give hope. I want to give inspiration. I want to put energy out into the world that helps make the world a better place. And I feel like, you know, my gift to do that is through music. And so, you know, I realize I can't, I always say this, I can't control the outcome, but I can control the output. And so with Keys to the Booth, I want to put out the best possible energy for the world. Do you encourage other people, aspiring talent, aspiring artists that want to put out music content on the web? Do you encourage that same type of formula or avenue to those now that we're in the age of all things considered web content? Uh, yes, I would. I, I would encourage it. I would encourage uh, others to do it. Um, uh, up and coming artists. I think the more that people can get to know you and experience your art in an intimate way, um, the better. You'll find your, your tribe. And don't don't worry about, you know, having Drake's fan base. Worry about, um, just focus on what's specific to you, what's unique and beautiful and, you know, sets, sets you apart from other people. Work on finding your audience. Um, don't, I would say, do what feels organic to you don't worry about uh don't hold yourself to other people's standards because one thing we've seen with the internet is that everything has an audience if you like scandinavian goat music you go on youtube and look for scandinavian goat music and lo and behold there's a following to support it so do whatever feels organic and authentic to you and put it out there um try to Find other audiences that, you know, find, like, like I said at the top of the um, podcast, find um, that world that you want to exist in and immerse yourself in it. So the same, I say that the same musically, immerse yourself in that sound, that vibe that you want to see reflected on yourself and bring the people in in an intimate way. Uh, a web series is one easy well not easy nothing's easy but it's one uh way to bring people in intimately to who you are as an artist so i, I would definitely recommend it and don't stop there do do more <laughs> gotta keep going gotta keep going so yeah. we only got yeah. a few minutes left coming out of the bv mobile apps podcast and we're going to definitely uh talk about your app really quick but i want to hit these questions really quick before we go further contract monetizing those two things first let's talk about it really quick monetizing and contracts uh is there a contract or agreement that needs to be presented when someone is working for a theater company or any type of company that's dealing with web content uh that's the next question and then the other question is monetizing how can one monetize off of these various projects uh absolutely great great questions um theater film tv in terms of contracts yes absolutely you should um working with anyone um you should always do an agreement um have some sort of agreement especially when you're dealing with an institution i know if you're an up-and-coming artist you're just dealing with one other person things like that um, it's, it is best to have an agreement of some sort. I can't say everything I've ever done with every, uh, you know, just every little thing I've ever done musically has always had a contract attached to it. But um, when it gets to the realm of things you see visually, you know, you're doing for compensation. If you're working for a theater, if you're working for a studio, uh, if you're working for a small production company that's doing web stuff online, Yes, absolutely. Get an agreement. Come up with, you know, what you want to do. It doesn't have to be, you know, a 30 page document that has, you know, super fine print. 
but it should be, you know, a basic working, hey, here's what's expected, here's what's being done. Um, so yeah, definitely, you need your protect protection. And one other thing I want to say to people, um, own your, uh, in terms of ownership, um, I just got my name trademarked. It's been in the works for a while, but um, J Keys, I am the official trademark owner of J Key, of the name J Keys. So in the United States, uh, Canada, and in the UK, I am the only one. You may go on the internet and see other people using the name, but um, I own the rights. So I think it's very important for artists to own their likeness, own their properties their, their their intellectual properties and so i would encourage that first and foremost even before you get to the point where you're collaborating you should be able to own your brand the last thing you want to do is work hard uh to 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 build a name you can't keep i was uh, a producer friend of mine um ab from cultural bastards um always said that to me he said you don't want to work to get a name to build a name you can't keep and so I want to encourage people to do that and then enter into agreements with institutions. Um, just get a basic working agreement, something that both of you guys feel comfortable with. And then the other part you the other part to the question you asked was um, monetization. Yes. So uh, that, that, yeah, that goes back to the contract. When you're scoring, it's pretty much a work for hire situation. I would say there is another um approach you could take to it um you know for instance with the web series you may not take a fee up front you may say you know what i believe in this project i uh, you may be able you may just negotiate um getting cut in on the project should it move forward you know a lot of times um people don't have huge budgets it's it's all in what's important to you and which what's needed at the time you know Somebody with the web series may only be able to pay you, you know, 300 bucks, 400 bucks, 500 bucks. And, you know, you could always one thing that I say to people is you could always take the upfront fee and be done. Or if you believe that you believe in a project and you don't necessarily need the money um, just for that particular transaction, you could also ask to get cut in um, from a royalty standpoint. So. Don't be afraid of royalties either. If you, I mean, if you have a roof over your head and you have all your bills paid and, you know, a project feels like it's on the move and you believe in the talent, um, you know, you could take a nominal fee, but don't be scared to negotiate for royalties. Negotiation is something that I feel like not enough artists um, are willing to do. Um I think it's very important. It's something that we shy away from because it feels, uh, I think a lot of times artists shy away from it because it feels counterintuitive. We, we do art um, and we don't, you know, we feel like the business could mess things up, but, you know, don't be afraid to negotiate, you know. Wise words from the one and only Jay Keys, man. And uh, before you go, of course, you have the Jay Keys app. And you also working on a few projects as well. Uh, you moving more into the direction of film, from my understanding. Uh, so before we let you go really quick, go ahead and tell the people about the app, what your next endeavor uh, and or projects will be coming in the near future. And also let people know how others can contact you and follow you on social media. Absolutely. Um, well, one of the best ways is to download my mobile app. Um, it was developed with BV Mobile Apps. You could you could find it in uh, the Apple Store, and you can also find it on Google Play as well as the Amazon Store. You can download it. Just search J dot Keys K E Y S. Download that mobile app. I put all my content there. Um, you can get it directly from your phone. You can stream my new songs, my music videos, my interviews, and things like that directly from your phone. You get it first before the world. And then also, um, you can find me online at J Keys Music. Anywhere, if there's social media, it is at J Keys Music. That is for Twitter, Instagram, TikTok. That is for YouTube, SoundCloud. At J Keys Music is how you find me. Um, and in terms of projects coming up, 
Let's see. So yes, I am um, one 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 big project. Um, I'm the music consultant for a Broadway uh, musical coming out. I can't really give you a release date because of COVID nineteen. I don't know when we're gonna go back to uh, stages and gathering and things like that. But when we do, I will be music consultant for my first Broadway musical I've done off Broadway, and then also um, I'm doing uh, music for a couple of television shows in development right now. So when things get full steam with, you know, filming and things like that, uh, you'll be able to check me out there as well as one thing I really want to plug. Um, my wife and I actually are building an art center in Detroit. We purchased a property um, just before COVID-19 hit and knocked everything to kind of to a halt. Um, but in this uh, place, we will have a, a, it'll be a multi multi-purpose space where you'll be able to do things like uh, rehearse, uh, film music videos um, on one floor. And then on another floor um, in the basement, we'll have a recording studio where you'll actually be able to cut records and rehearse with musicians and DJs and producers and so on and so forth. And then the top floor is, is like artist housing. So this is uh something that we're working on in detroit we got the funding secure and um you know we could always use a little more to make some enhancements so uh people out there watching or listening rather that want to support the movement um definitely you can hit me on social media and you'll be hearing more about that but yeah the art center is another big thing that's a, a, a real big uh big one for us all right. Well, that's Jay Keys, ladies and gentlemen. JayKeys.com is the website, and people can follow you at Jay Keys on all social media, Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram, correct? Yes, sir. That's at Jay Keys Music, at Jay Keys Music, and then JayKeys.com as well. Okay, Jay Keys, we got to have you back next time, whether it's on this podcast or another platform. But I really appreciate you for taking time out of your busy schedule to talk to the listeners and to educate our listeners and to give listeners uh, background history of what you do on a music level and to let people know about Keys. Yes, indeed. It is available on YouTube so people can go stream it and watch it on YouTube. Thank you, Sean. And uh, you can hit that directly at the link keys to the booth dot com. Um, it will take you right there. Um, it's also available on um, IGTV as well. All right. So definitely, ladies and gentlemen, please go check it out and support Jay Keys. Much success to you, Jay Keys. We wish you nothing but the best in your future endeavors. And don't be no stranger to the BB Mobile Ads podcast in the near future. Absolutely. Sean, I appreciate you having me. Brother, have a, have a good one. And salute. All right. Salute to the one and only Jay Keys. This is Sean Garvey with the BB Mobile Apps Podcast. Make sure you go to bbmobileapps.com for all your app needs. They will get your app customized today. That's bbmobileapps.com for more information. I'm Sean Garvey. Follow me on all social media at Sean Garvey ATL on Twitter, Instagram, and Sean Garvey on Facebook. Tune in to another great edition of the BB Mobile Apps Podcast with your host, Sean Garvey. Have a great one. It's a new year, it's a new day, we're starting it over, starting the day. Thank you for listening to the BV Mobile Apps Podcast with your host, Sean Garvey. For more information about BV Mobile Apps, visit the, the website, website. bvmobileapps.com. Don't forget to follow BV Mobile Apps on social media at BV Mobile Apps. Tune in again next time on the BV Mobile Apps Podcast.